Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jumana Baroudi, Director of Care Services Program for the Greater Chicago Chapter of the ALS Association, and I'm pleased to welcome to welcome you all to our second installment of the Virtual ALS Roundtable Teleseries. We want to thank our distinguished speakers for choosing to spend their Saturday with us sharing exciting news and updates on research they are working on. Moderating today's session is Dr. Raymond Roos. Dr. Raymond Roos is a Marjorie Robert and Strauss Professor of Neurological Science in the Department of Neurology at the University of Chicago and Director of the ALS Association Certified Treatment Center of Excellence there. In addition to clinical activities, he's involved in laboratory studies in ALS. He looks forward to the time that a cure will be found and put him out of business. Before I hand it over to Dr. Roos, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. All attendees will be placed on mute at all times. If you have any question, please use the chat box located at the bottom, of, the bottom center of your screen. We will have about 35 minutes dedicated to a Q&A session at the end of the program. We will hopefully get all the answers to the questions within the, that time frame. Uh, if we, for some reason, cannot address all the questions within that time, we will follow up via email. A recording of this session will be available at a later time, and we will let you know via email. Thank you again, and enjoy this program. Dr. Roos, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you, Jumana, uh, for the introduction. And thank you also um, for all you do for the ALS Association. And I want to thank the ALS Association as well. Um, I, I think we have two astounding speakers uh, and I'm honored to be able to introduce them. The title of this program is What's New in ALS Therapy? And there's an update on new clinical trials and ALS research. Um, I wanted to take one minute uh, before um, I introduce our first speaker um, and talk about something maybe a little bit old in ALS therapy, but uh, it's important because it, it shows how one learns from the speakers, but, but also from nurses such as Jumana and uh, many of the other nurses. And this goes back some years when I was in the ALS clinic and a uh, pastor um, brought in um, uh, his wife who had ALS and had significant problems um, uh, with weakness. Um, really, as a result, she looked a little bit unkempt. And I evaluated this patient. And my nurse at that time uh, looked at the patient and said, I know what we could do for you, what you need. And I was thinking to myself, gee, what, what does Roberta have in mind? And Roberta said, I'm going to give you a shampoo. Now, it turns out that, that Roberta actually, prior to being a nurse, was a hairdresser. And so she went in the back room and shampooed this ALS patient's hair. And as they were leaving, I saw them with big smiles, both the patient and the husband. So uh, the moral of the story is, yes, we, we're all looking for what's new in ALS therapy, but there are spiritual interactions that one could do as a caregiver, as a spouse, as a friend, and those were meaningful in the past, and they're still very meaningful. And if we don't pay attention to those, we probably don't have the holistic, comprehensive treatment of ALS patients we need. So um, I'm going to move on from that story to introduce Dr. Merit Sikovich, who is Chief of Neurology at Mass General Hospital. 
and the Julianne Dorn Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School. And just to put things in perspective, if you ask me who's the most prominent ALS person involved in clinical trials from the beginning and the middle and the end, um, I think that the top 10 people that would be listed would have Merritt's name. And really, as a result, she won the 2009 Sheila S. ALS Award, the 2017 Forbes Norris Award from the International Motor Neuron Disease Alliance, the 2017 Pinnacle Award from the Boston Chamber of Commerce, and the 2019 Ray Adams American Neurological Association Award. And I probably forgot a few. Um, I'm sorry, Merritt. Uh, anyway, we're, we're looking forward to uh, your perspective um, on what's new in ALS therapy development update on ALS treatments, genetic approaches, and trials. Please, Mary, thank you. Thank you, Ray, and thank you, Jemana, for inviting me here. And, um, and it's a pleasure to be on the same Zoom with Kuldeep. We work so closely together with the ALS Association, and they support so much of the work that's made us get to the point where we have uh, time and uh, enough content to really talk about where therapies are going in ALS. So I'm very happy to be here. Part of uh, why many of us like Ray and myself stay in the field, we're, we're all, uh, we fall for our patients in the way that you just described and we share this passion and commitment to try to uh, find treatments and find ways to make life better for everybody with ALS until as Ray said, we can all retire which we're looking forward to do as fast as possible. Um, so I'm gonna uh, share my screen here and see if this works. So I'm happy to spend the next uh, about you know, 25, 30 minutes talking about where we are on therapy development. And everything we do is tied to working as a community together, to the scientists like Ray in the lab and the clinicians, uh, the patients, and the foundations. And I, I just want to take a moment to really thank uh, one of my patients, Sean Healy, pictured here, whose um, you know, really vision uh, last year um, uh, allowed him and his friends to support, to give us initial support so that we could launch a new way of doing trials in ALS, which I'll tell you about. But there's many, many other new things going on. And I'm going to try to give you a high level update on where we are on, on therapies, all types of therapies in ALS. So there's several treatments that are in what I call late stage testing, which means that if these are positive, they would be the next treatments to go forward in, uh, to marketing. And I'd say in my 25 years in ALS, I've never seen so many things in late stage testing. So that gives me a lot of hope that we're gonna have some more marketed treatments to provide our patients. There's also a huge therapeutic pipeline. There's, uh, as you'll see, more than 160 companies working on ALS, that's unheard of. You know, there used to be a time when there might be one, you know, even, and that wasn't so long ago. So, and that tells me that, that there's enough science and enough targets um, and a pathway to get uh, drug mark uh, to approval that there's uh, industry in interest in this uh, field, which we need. And then lastly, because of so many things in the pipeline, we can't test things one time, one at a time, and we have to get innovative about how we can do this faster so that we can get the best treatments for our patients as quick as possible. And, and Ray, uh, I know you're a, a lab-based scientist and a clinician, so I apologize in advance for summarizing all of ALS science on one slide, but I want to, to, to I'm a clinical trialist, but um, we learn a lot from the genetic forms of the illness, even though most people with ALS don't have the genetic form, about 10% do. Uh, but there's overlap in the biologies of what happens in the people who have the illness because of a genetic change, uh, genetic mutation, something they inherit, and those who, who get it for other reasons. And we learn uh, what um, biologies might be uh, not working well and what can we target. So we've, we've learned a ton, the fields have learned a ton, that there's definitely problems with how your body takes care of um, proteins that are perhaps made incorrectly how you move these proteins up and down the motor uh, nerve axons, how you make proteins in the first place called RNA biology. And that um, as you look in people with ALS, that we see some common themes on 
with a protein uh, misfolding, something called TBP43, and how that's handled. And all of this tells the clinical trials and the clinicians and the companies that there's things that we can target to try to um, slow down this illness and ultimately stop it. And then what we really want to do even after that is to prevent it from coming in the first place. So a lot of the treatments are targeting um, these different pathways. And it might be that a lot like in some of the cancer treatments that we're going to need um, many, you know, several, like a cocktail of treatments for people. And we might need different treatments for different people um, based on their biology. But we're finally at the point where we're developing those tools to be able to understand how to do that better. So I mentioned this uh, 100, now I have to update my slide, 160 companies, but I wanted to highlight a few of the treatments. Um, and and uh, um, I'll tell you the color code are, the ones in red are in what I call the late stage testing, meaning that if those treatments are positive, that might be all we need to do to get to a uh, drug to market. The light blue are things that have been in earlier phase trial, but have positive results. And just to have that many uh, things in late testing, that many red things, and that many things with positive uh, treatments, blue, is, is just amazing uh, for this field. So just to highlight the ones in red a little bit, the AMX0035 is um, a treatment that, um, that just finished a trial. They announced the positive results in a press release, and then shortly are going to show all that data. Um, Aramoclamol is a... a, a a drug that helps uh, with that protein misfolding I mentioned. And that's in a late stage testing that's expected to read out in the first half of 2021. Neuron, uh, the other one in red, is a, a stem cell trial. Uh, those results are expected at the end of this year. Uh, and there's another stem cell trial called, uh, with a company called CoreStem that's also um, in late stage testing. So a lot of activity um, in there. Um, the good news is that there's lots of groups that are working together to try to go through this pipeline quickly. And one of them is the Northeast ALS Consortium, uh, which uh, University of Chicago is part of um, and, and has 134 centers really throughout the United States and the world that work together on therapy development. And this is important in a rare disease uh, where you want to learn from everybody with the illness and you want to make sure you lower the barrier um, to science and, and you speed things up. And so this consortium is now led by John Glass and uh, actually Tim Miller and uh, Jinzy Andrews um, and has um, more than 500 investigators. And these are the whole teams, the nurses, the physical therapists, the scientists, the clinicians, the patients, all working together to try to solve this disease. Um, and um, this foundation has been supported by the ALS Association almost since its uh, initiation in, in the early, uh, in the mid 1990s. And that has allowed us to do some really important things for the field. So every study that we do, we ensure that the samples collected uh, in those studies are shared for the community in a huge biorepository uh, that the ALS Association helped us start and is currently supporting. Uh, we share all the, um, the clinical data, particularly from the group of people that aren't, don't get the, the um, drug, and that's an open source um, uh, database called PROACT, and also, again, supported by the ALS Association. And this, uh, these data sets have been used by scientists all over the world and companies all over the world. And it's part of why when companies start going to ALS, they feel like the, the pathway has been paved for them, and then it's easier for them to, to get the knowledge they need to be able to move forward their drug. Another thing that this group did together is they really looked at how our trial started. I mean, there was this traditional way that every hospital in the trial would review the protocol and decide if it was okay to, to go forward. That process could take a whole year to get like 60 centers off the ground. So we developed a, a much better way called the central IRB where one hospital reviews it and all the hospitals in the trial rely on that one hospital review. And that can shave about uh, nine months of time off the of startup. And as we know, as I hear from our patients, um, there is an ALS clock, and that's a clock that has to move fast. And so uh, one of the things this group does is it looks at these things that slow, slow process down and tries to solve them. And, and, and setting up that central IRB was critical. And again, we did that with the support of the ALS Association. So, uh, so we now have um, three marketed drugs for people with ALS, uh, Rilazol and Radicava, both uh, slow down the disease course. Um, not enough, you know, because we need more than that, but it's definitely a good start. 
and then Nudexa, which is the symptomatic treatment for something called pseudobulbar affect. But there's a lot of other things in the pipeline because we really want to get to the point where we're um, having dramatic effects on the disease. Um, and I wanted to, to bring up that there's three approaches right now that are, are underway to try to, to accelerate therapy development. And they each have their, their benefits and each have their challenges. Uh, but but um, I wanted to share a little bit about why trials are designed certain ways. One way to get to a quicker answer is to try to um, pick a group of people who are more likely to respond for, for your drug. And you can do that with clinical features or you can do that with biological features. And so Daravone, which is uh, one of the marketed drugs, they took a group of people that were early in their illness and progressing fast. And they were able to show in six months that their drug slowed down the illness by a third. The Amalix study I, meant, I mentioned did the same thing. They, they used clinical features to try to get a group that was more similar to each other so that in a smaller number of people in a shorter time, they could get an answer. And Neuron also did it that way. So that's one trial approach. Um, Another way is to say, I know that my drug works on this biology, and I'm only going to pick people who have the, that biology. Um, and for example, some of the gene therapy trials are doing that approach. And that is, as a scientist, that makes a lot more sense. But sometimes that's not possible to do. It's only possible to do if you have the tools to measure that biology. And then the last kind of new way is instead of testing every drug in its own trial, uh, build an infrastructure that can test multiple drugs at one time so that at the end of, let's say, six months, you get an answer to three or five drugs and not one. And I'll go through each of these. So this is the uh, Radicava drug, and this was approved uh, a couple years ago in the U.S. And, and they, they did this um, technique of kind of taking early, fast, progressing patients, and they were able to show this 33% slowing of the illness at six months. But the challenge on this one is it leaves us not knowing, uh, does the drug only work in that population or, or is that just a good trial tool and actually works in everybody? And I'd say we still don't know this. Uh, the FDA did approve it for all forms of the illness and most of us do give it to everybody with ALS. Um, but that trial technique leaves uh, people a little bit not knowing all the answers. But that might be okay in an illness like ALS where uh, it's, it's probably better if you think a drug works to get it out to everybody while you work out some of these other questions. So the Amalex company, they have a drug called AMX0035. And uh, this was started by two young gentlemen uh, while they were college students who had an idea that there's so much going on in ALS, maybe you need to give more than one drug at a time. Maybe you need to target different biologies. And so they picked two drugs, one that worked on um, something called uh, molecular chaperoning. So this is part of your cell that helps um, uh, get rid of proteins that might not be made uh, correctly. And so they took this drug, sodium phenobutrate, uh, that, that uh, worked on that target. And they added it to another drug called Tudka or terosodiol that works on how your cells make energy or the mitochondria. And they showed in the lab that both these drugs could protect motor neurons, but they were much better when given together. They were synergistic. And so they did this trial in people with ALS that they announced in January uh, in a press release that it was a positive trial, meaning it hit its primary outcome measure. Um, the primary measure was um, the functional rating scale and to slow it by at least 30%. Now, they haven't been able to re uh, report the full, uh, full data, but that's expected soon. So this is a hopeful approach. And it also tells you that um, the idea can come from anywhere. This was a group, uh, these were two people that weren't ALS scientists. They hadn't even graduated from college, but they had a good idea and they came to the Northeast ALS Consortium and they asked the ALS experts for help and that group gave them help to get it all the way through this trial. And that's one of the things that I love about the ALS community. It, it really ha does lower the barriers and we all have the same shared passion and purpose to try to cure this illness. So, um, the other approach I want to talk about a little bit is targeting the biology, because this is the ideal way to do it, but sometimes you don't have all the tools to do it this way. But for the genetic forms of the illness, we really do have those tools. And you know, the very first person I ever took care of with ALS, Susan uh, Welch here, she had the familial form of the ALS. Um, and uh, she was diagnosed in 1994, right after the first gene was found, the SOD1 gene that was found by many groups uh, here in Chicago and in Boston and all over the world. And um, 
so we know now that that gene mutation causes the illness. And if you can lower the amount of that uh, protein, that that can uh, be effective in pre um, preventing motor disease that showed that. So in 2011, with the support of the ALS Association and the Muscular Dystrophy Association, uh, Tim Miller, myself, and Niels did the first gene, in a way, gene therapy study for ALS. Um, and it, it was a safety study, it was very safe, but it turned out that at that point, this was such a new technology that the type of treatment we were doing had some safety issues in the animal model. So and it had nothing to do with lowering SOD1, it really had to do more with the backbone of the delivery part of that. So uh, their company that was making this, Ionis uh, Pharmaceuticals, had to reboot and make a different version of it. And unfortunately, that takes time. And it took about four years. Um, but fast forward to now, uh, a better version of it was made in a phase one trial was repeated, uh, a safety study with, with that drug. Uh, and this is now with Biogen and Ionis and uh, many uh, places all over the world. Um, and we just reported these results in the New England Journal of Medicine about a month ago. Um, and I'll just give you the high points. So this enrolled only people with the gene mutation in uh, something called SOD1. Um, and there were 50 participants. Um, most of them got the drug called Tefersin. And this is a drug that directly targets the uh, SOD1 and lowers the amount of the protein that's made. People got the drug in the spinal fluid space by uh, lumbar puncture. They got five treatments. Um, there was a 12-week dosing period and then a 12-week follow-up, and then everybody could roll over into what we call an open-label extension, where everybody gets the drug. And four doses were tested. And I'll just show you the high points. One is that the drug did what it's supposed to do. It lowered SOD1 levels. And you can see here in a dose-dependent manner, with a, at the highest dose, 100 milligrams, it lowered it by almost 40%. And that was what we expected based on our uh, initial uh, pharmacokinetic studies in the animal models. So that's important because you want to make sure your drug is targeting what it's supposed to target. Um, this is some of the clinical data. Now this was a small safety study, so it wasn't, didn't have enough people to be definitive, but there were definitely some in, really encouraging trends with people um, on the Tefersin group, on the active treatment, progressing much slower than people who didn't receive the treatment in that 12-week period. Again, then everybody rolled over to open label extension, which is what's happening now. So the other thing we want to do is, does it lower any marker of motor neuron damage? And so there's this relatively new marker called neurofilament that people think might be a good measure of what's going on in the motor neurons. And this drug was able to show that that, that neurofilament level, which is usually elevated in people with ALS, could be lowered by about 50% at 12 weeks by the, the treatment with Tefersin. So that, that's also encouraging. So all this was really good data to suggest that if you can target uh, the cause of the illness, you can have an effect on the biology of the illness. Um, and now this has gone on into a phase three trial all over the world and the results are expected in 2021. So we showed that it was safe, that we could reduce the SOD1 levels. There was at least a suggestion of good clinical effects and uh, really enough to go rapidly forward. And this trial was actually adapted and amended to go straight into phase three trials so that there was no delay. Um, everyone's gonna be waiting eagerly for these results. Now this type of approach, this anti-sense oligo approach where you turn off a gene, is now also being used in a different form of genetic ALS caused by mutations in uh, chromosome nine mutation, C9 or 72. So, and, and that result, those trials are ongoing, but even, even, I wouldn't say better, but even related to this is that same technology can be used for um, tackling problems in sporadic ALS in the 90% of people who don't have the genetic form. So you can use the same uh, technology to turn up or turn down different proteins of interest. So for example, there's a trial that will start this fall, also by Biogen, where they're using the same technology, to, but to lower something called a taxin-2 which is a protein that we think is important in all forms of ALS. And so that trial is using a gene therapy technology but for sporadic disease. So we learn a ton from, from every, every, every type of trial that happens and we can learn from the genetic forms of the illness to help the, the more common sporadic. 
So that is just, it's just super exciting to be able to even like turn on and turn off genes in people. It just sounded like science fiction 20 years ago, but there are other marketed drugs for other diseases of that approach. And it's now been in at least two trials in the OS and another one coming. So I want to switch in my last couple minutes to the, the Healy platform trial, which I'm very excited to share has started enrolling about three weeks ago. And now there's 12, 12 of our 54 centers are active and enrolling and another 18 to be open very soon. Um, so I, I think I'm going to hope to convince you that this is the right way to test treatments in ALS now and why. Um, and the, the high points I would say is that this type of approach, which I'll describe, cuts the time to get into effective treatments in half. Okay, so and time is, is, is critical for ALS. It cuts the cost in, by about a third and increases the, the, the uh, number of people that are going to be on the active treatment during the trial by 67%. So it's, it's, it's got a lot of pluses in here. Um, and so um, taking a super conservative approach, and I'll say that I think we can do much better than this. If you assume you know, one in 10 treatments that you test works, which again, is, is, I think we can do much better than that now. But to take that assumption, this is what the statisticians did. We, if we tested one drug at a time, we'd be here 12 years later before we found the first effective treatment. But if you do a platform approach, it'll take four years. Again, if you pick drugs that are better, have a, a better chance in 10%, it'll be even much faster than that. And you also need much fewer patients and many fewer people are, get, not, get the, what we call the placebo during the treatment. So there's good rationale for doing this. So in a typical trial, when you do test one drug at a time, you have to spend about a year kind of designing the protocol, getting all your sites, what we call building the stadium. Um, and then when the trial is down again, um, it's, it's terribly inefficient. Uh, in the platform approach, you build that infrastructure once and you keep it going until you find the cures. And that could be a couple of years, it could be Two years, I mean, it really depends on the drugs that you put in there. Um, but you never uh, dismantle this until you find the effective treatment. And that's what we're doing in ALS now. And so for a person that might enroll in a platform trial, you come in and you're, you are randomized, so you're assigned at random to any one of the uh, available treatments. And we're starting with three, but you could, I mean, there have been platform trials in other diseases that have done 14, trials, 14 drugs at one time, but we're starting with three with two more that we're gonna add shortly afterwards. So you get randomized to whatever one of the ones that are available. You'll know which treatment you're on, if you're on the first one, the second one, or the third one. And then there's another randomization uh, to drug or placebo. And here it's three to one. So 75% of people are gonna be on the active treatment and 25% on placebo. In the traditional way, it's usually 50-50. So it's uh, much again better for patients. And at the end of the six months, um, you, uh, you, everybody goes on open label extension, so everyone gets drugs. And the, what you do for the analysis is you take everybody in the active group, let's say that it's gonna be 120 people in the, in the green active group, and you compare them to everybody in the placebo from all the groups. You're pooling the placebo group. So you still get that one-to-one -one comparison, that 120 to 120, um, but you're doing it by sharing the placebo groups. And that's where you get the efficiencies of the cost, and you also get the increase, great, huge increase for patients of the chance of being on the active drug during that 24 weeks. And again, everyone is on it after the 24 weeks. But people also have the option of after 24 weeks, if they wanna go and, and, and go into another arm, they can do that as well. So it's really uh, was built uh, with the patients kind of at the center and with a lot of input from patients. The other thing you can do in the platform trial is you can keep learning about the disease. So in a traditional trial, uh, let's say you do the trial, let's say the drug doesn't work, and the company's collected all these samples in the meantime, those samples belong to the company and they might or might not do more research on it. In a way, it could be a lost opportunity for the ALS field. In the platform trial, we're designing it that those fluids belong to the community. They're for ALS research, they're always gonna be used and always available so that you can keep learning about the biology of the illness. So, um, so we got a lot of input on this. Um, and uh, again, because of this amazing ALS community uh, with patients and, and the investigators and the scientists, we got buy-in uh, very quickly. And we also got buy-in from the FDA, who's very supportive of this way of lowering costs and being more efficient. So we designed uh, um, the trial uh, with the input of uh, all these people 
on this um, slide. And we hired the best statisticians out there who've done this for cancer. And uh, we, got, we formed a patient advisory committee that gave us uh, input on the design of the study as well. We picked 54 of our centers uh, throughout the Northeast ALS Consortium. We actually have about 25 other sites uh, who are kind of our backup sites who want to join. And we're using that one ethics uh, central review that I mentioned that saves uh, time. Um, we actually, because of uh, the initial gift from the Healy family and AMG, we um, said we were going to pick the companies that could be the first ones, and we made it more into grants. And so we had 30 applications, um, and the top five were picked. And now companies can continue to be part of this, uh, but they apply and they cover their entire cost. Um, we also got, um, as I'll show you later, we wrote grants to the ALS Association, which we received and very grateful for, the um, IMALS um, and MDA and ALS Finding a Cure. So this is really a partnership between uh, philanthropy foundations uh, and industry. So the first five treatments we picked have different mechanisms of action. One is a complement five inhibitor um, and another a myeloproxate inhibitor. Those are both drugs that work on the immune system. And there's lots of data in ALS that the, the more activated one's immune system is, the faster the disease course. Uh, the, the fifth one on the list is also working on the immune system. These are all working in different ways, and I'd be happy if we have time to go into more of their biology. The third one is our gold nanocrystals that help catalyze reactions in the brain that improve cellular energy. The fourth one is a sigma-1 receptor agonist that helps plug some of the leakiness we see in how the, the genetic material in the cell gets from one area to the other, um, and also helps uh, stimulate um, survival of the motor neurons by uh, secretion of different growth factors. So these all had great science, and they were ready to go into patients. We met a couple times with the FDA, and I just want to say sometimes the FDA gets a bad rep, and, and, uh, but uh, I'd say here, their interactions were phenomenal. Um, they, uh, they have told us we can meet with them as many times as we want. They are very supportive. They give us great feedback. And we got our, what we call our May Proceed letter for the platform trial in uh, January of 2020. Um, so we've, we've built this uh, master protocol. And every time we want to add another drug, and this is where the efficiency comes, instead of starting all over again at the kind of stadium again, we just amend the master protocol. So instead of something taking 12 months to start, it can start to take one or two months. So we can keep adding uh, drugs as more science is learned. Um, so uh, for this study, um, we did a lot of modeling to see what, uh, what uh, how can we be as broad as possible to allow as many people uh, in the trial as possible, but uh, also do it in a way that we can get an answer at 24 weeks and whether the drug works or not. And, and so we came up with these inclusion criteria based on that modeling. And we use that PROACT database I mentioned, which has all the pooled data from prior trials uh, to do that modeling. Um, so when people come in, again, uh, we did start in, uh, in mid-July, they're randomized to either regimen A, B, or C. Then there's another randomization to, uh, within the regimen at three to one, and it's for 24 weeks. So uh, we were honestly going to start in March. We had a kickoff meeting. We had to switch to um, virtual in a, a really a short notice in March. Uh, timing wasn't ideal on this. Uh, but we had a, our virtual meeting um, to train our sites. And uh, we, we had to um, put a little pause on it because of the pandemic. Uh, but we kept working during that pause to change and modify the protocol so that it could be basically what I call COVID-19 proof, that we can do this trial and not stop no matter what happens with that pandemic. So I really do hope that it get, get, keeps moving in the right direction for that. So I hope I've convinced you that platform trials can really accelerate how you uh, go through a big pipeline when you have a great pipeline like you do in ALS. Um, there's a huge support for this from um, the, the FDA, from pharma companies, from clinicians and scientists, and most importantly, from the patients. It's a perpetual trial. It's gonna continue until we find treatments that are effective. Um, it's open to companies to, to put in their drugs and we have huge interest. We're getting lots of calls from companies that wanna be part of this. And um, even more importantly, we're getting a lot of calls from patients who wanna be part of that. And we're trying, uh, trying to open as many sites as possible, as fast as possible, so that people don't have to travel far to be part of the study.
Um, so a lot of people support this and, and a huge thanks to Kaldeep and uh, others at the ALS Association who have been uh, working with us from the beginning, uh, giving their input and giving their support and they're part of our, our committee and working hand in hand with us. So, um, and with that, I'll, um, I'll pass the, the Zoom mic back to Ray. Uh, thank you so much, Merritt. Um, does everybody hear me? Merritt, do you hear I me? I can hear you. I can okay. hear you. Okay. Um, so I, I wanted to uh, just take a minute and put this in perspective. Um, I would say 20, 25 years ago, um, if we had one clinical trial going, that was a lot. And I, I have to say that the clinical trials were not very sophisticated. I'm not sure that um, we knew how to run them as well as we do now. And over the years and, and decades, uh, it's been phenomenal. That number one, we have this large group. It used, it's called the Northeast ALS um, group of consortium, but, but really it's not Northeast, it's national or international in fact. And um, we have very sophisticated statistics, uh, drug distribution, um, and clinical trialists. So it's, um, it's been a revolution. Uh, and you get that feeling when you realize, number one, the, there was a paper uh, that Merritt showed in the New England Journal of Medicine, July 2020, just for everybody, the New England Journal of Medicine, I don't know, we probably have 50 to 100 journals, and the New England Journal of Medicine has to be at the top. Um, so this is uh, a great achievement. The SOD study with um, antisense oligonucleotides, um, all of this relies on not only knowing how to do clinical trials, but new technologies that are cutting edge that we couldn't have even begun to envision a while back. Um, and it's still moving along. So um, I'm optimistic about things. And I should mention, I don't know whether this is seen, but um, Shale, uh, this is his email address, and he is um, involved in the Healy Center trial at the University of Chicago. So it's S. Bhatnagar, B-H-A-T-N-A-G-A-R, at neurology.bsd.uchicago.edu. Um, if you sure. We will post that at the video. Okay, great. We will send this in the, in the email. You could so, put it in the uh, chat. One of the things that our That's right. <laughs> our progress in clinical trials absolutely depends on is research. And the ALS Association has been a wonderful partner to the ALS community, both the clinical and the scientific community. Uh, we have, I'm honored to say, Dr. Kaldeep Dave, who is scientific director, vice president of research, but he's the chief when it comes to research at the ALS Association. Um, he's only been in this position for a little bit over a year, but we are very fortunate that um, he spent uh, over um, some period of time working in the Parkinson's Disease Research Foundation, the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And he comes with a PhD in pharmacology and physiology. Um, so uh, he's going to tell us a little bit um, about what's going on uh, with respect to ALS Association and research. Kaldeep. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ruth and Jamana, for um, welcoming me uh, to speak today. Uh, I hope you all can hear me. I'm sitting in the, on, on my deck in the back, backyard. Um, so, uh, and, and thank you uh, to Dr. Sikovich for that uh, amazing uh, clinical trial landscape. I think 
Um, I'm going to speak about that a little bit, and uh, uh, but I will I won't have to really talk a lot about that slide since Merit did such a great job with uh, setting that up. Uh, okay, so what I'll do today is talk to you a little bit about what who we are, what we do, uh, sort of um, give you some appreciation of the ALS ecosystem, uh, where we fit in. Um, the clinical trial landscape, some state of the field, and then end with um, uh, some of the projects that we have funded in the last six months, or the first six months of this year, I should say. Uh, so with that, um, if uh, we can go to the next slide, please. All right. So uh, we are the largest philanthropic funder of ALS research in the, in the world, not just in America. Uh, and what makes us different from other organizations is this um, three-pronged approach. We are not just a research organization, and, and that's important, uh, but we are an organization that provides care services through our chapters and multidisciplinary clinics uh, across the United States and uh, by doing advocacy uh, to raise funds for uh, ALS research. And, and research uh, that we do and the funding and investments that we make are not done in some isolation. They're done with care services and advocacy in mind. Um, so just going to the, the gray box on the left, uh, since the ice bucket challenge, and we all remember that back in 2014, uh, the ALS Association has committed over $110 million um, for ALS research. Um, currently, this is currently today, as of today, we have uh, about 175 active research projects spanning 15 different countries. Um, we, we don't believe in, um, uh, we believe in best science. We don't care where that idea comes from and, and, and our portfolio uh, actually shows that. Uh, last year alone, fiscal year 20, uh, we funded 70 projects totaling around $21.5 million. And, and I'll go through this in a minute, but we fund research, we fund infrastructure uh, grants, we fund training and education grants. All of this is very important. Um, what makes us different, I think, from other nonprofit organizations is exactly the magnitude, the scope, and I'll go into the scope, and this in integration of mission between care services and advocacy. And I think what also sets us different is uh, this leveraging, um, you know, of threefold of our funding. Look, this is a complex field. You saw that in merit slides. Um, this is a complex challenge. It's a complex disease we're not gonna be able to do this all on our own. And, and so our goal is to fund at the critical step uh, and hopefully help researchers get enough data so that they can then get larger funding, larger partnerships uh, and, and further that research. And an example of this is that uh, last year we did a research uh, survey and we showed that our $30 million of our funding uh, resulted in researchers being able to get $120 million um, of, uh, of funding, follow-on funding. Uh, and I think that's the strength uh, that we're able to have a wider impact with our research dollars. Next slide. So, you know, it's important to understand how do drugs get to the market? And, and you know, Merit did a great job in showing you the different things we have in this blue stage, phase one, phase two, phase three. But there's a lot that goes on before that and after that. And, and let me just give me, give me the three minutes to go through this. So if you start all the way on the left, where it says biology and genetics of ALS, this is where we find new targets to make drugs against. And so, you know, Yes, it's good to know about biology, but that's not just a bench exercise. We need to understand the biology. We need to understand what is different in ALS so that then we can make drugs against that protein target. And that's why that, that area uh, of um, what we call target identification, 
target validation, gene sequencing, those types of research is really important. If you look under that in purple, risks and causes of ALS, uh, you know, Merit mentioned this, 90% of the ALS is non-genetic. Um, we can't really point to a particular gene. So what are the risks and causes? What, what is out there in, in our environment, in, in our occupations, in our diet, uh, that may predispose us or increase our susceptibility to getting ALS? Again, understanding that will help us because we can either prevent ALS uh, by reducing or mitigating those risks and causes or make drugs against them. So if you move from there to the next stage is where drug, drug development happens. So this is where, you know, uh, Merit showed in the slide, different targets with different pathways, our understanding the biology. Now we start making drugs against that protein target. And this is what pharmaceutical companies and biotechnology companies do. They will make compounds, gene therapies, whatever it is, against those targets and and that and they they make those uh, they make them chemically make them biologically make them they test them in animals they test them whether they're safe and tolerable before they bring them into the clinic which is the the next stage phase one phase two phase three stages uh, not to forget biomarkers development biomarkers are extremely important what's a biomarker Cholesterol is a biomarker. Cholesterol is a biomarker for heart disease. We don't have such biomarkers. Merit mentioned uh, neurofilament light NFL, which is one of the most uh, promising biomarkers we have currently. But it's very important to have biomarkers so that we can select patients, we can make these uh, ALS trials smaller and faster, and we can have objective measures to look at, to measure in those trials. Um, after that, you move into the blue stages, phase one, where you check whether the drug is safe, phase two, whether you check the drug is safe and starts to work in a smaller population, and phase three, where again, you check if the drug is safe and you uh, start to test in a larger population. Um, all of that, as you see underneath that, happens through infrastructure, data sharing, tools development, training of clinical scientists, training of the uh, uh, scientists in, in general. And then on the right side, as you can see, when the drugs get on the market, or if they're not on the market either, there are lots of things uh, that we could be doing, uh, re research in assistive technology. Uh, you, you all are living ALS. You, you have the wheelchairs and the technology and the devices, uh, and our research can help uh, develop and, and validate those devices, telehealth, telemedicine approaches, um, families and caregiver burden, uh, research into understanding how, how much of a burden this is on caregivers, uh, access, does, do all patients have equal access to, to drugs, to, uh, to health insurance, to care, uh, natural history studies to understand the progression of this very complex disease and patient service. Um, this is also important uh, because we want to integrate your voice, the patient voice, into clinical trials. Next slide. And the red is all of what ALS Association funds. And you can see we have a huge footprint in terms of our research funding. This is our scope. There's really not much that we do not fund. We fund biology and prevention and risk and causes, drug development, biomarkers and acid development validation, phase one studies, phase two studies. And even uh, we have funded some biomarker components of phase three studies. Um, like every other organization, a nonprofit organization in every disease, we're not big enough to fund uh, phase three studies, but we can fund valuable biomarker components of phase three studies and help, um, help those phase three studies go forward. We fund assistive technology research, uh, natural history studies, uh, family caregiver burden. And I think a big part of our funding goes into infrastructure, uh, data management, data sharing. Um, Merit talked about uh, the PROAC database, 
uh, we fund that database uh, so that everybody learns from everybody else's research. Uh, we develop tools so that uh, researchers don't have to spend time and money making those tools. If we make them, we can make them available equally and uh, cheaply, hopefully, uh, to, uh, to the field. And next slide. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Uh, Merit did such a great job at this that, uh, but again, just to, um, I think, belabor a couple of points here look at the landscape. It is as robust as you can get. Um, uh, you know, we have 64 trials that are currently enrolling. This is as of May 2020. This may have changed. Uh, we may have added a few more in the last couple of months. Um, and, and, and so many more that have al already stopped enrolling because they, they have their uh, number of patients that they needed. I think the other point to look at this slide is Look at the different types of drugs that are in there. There are small molecule compounds. These are chemistry compounds like arimoclamol or um, mesitinib. Uh, there are things like um, uh, genetic therapies like Tregs that Stanapel is developing or the Tofusen Valor trial that uh, Merit mentioned, the, the NSN technology. Uh, there are, um, and, and there are various pathways. There's inflammation here. Uh, there's oxidative pathway, RNS-60 hits that. Uh, and, 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 uh, and of course, the Healy platform. The asterisks that you see there are all of the studies or technologies that ALS Association supported or are supporting currently. Uh, and I think that, again, tells you that we want to make sure we accelerate um, drug development for ALS. Next slide. So what is the state of the field? And again, Merit touched on a lot of these things, but the state of the field is good. Look, it's the best, best place to be at right now. Um, let me start from the top here right, in blue. Robust understanding uh, of ALS. We know so much more about the disease today, about the genes, about the different causes, the different pathways, how genetic and sporadic ALS may be uh, sort of converging, uh, gene sequencing approaches, omics, uh, epidemiology studies. These are all telling us what are the next target? What's the next protein that we need to go after? If you then move to the, to the sort of the anti-clockwise to the red, and Merit talked about this, diverse biological targets. We need this. We know this is a heterogeneous disease. It, it, it's not going to be a one medication for everybody. We're going to need more than one and sometimes combination therapies like the Amelix compound um, to hit multiple targets to have a, uh, have a real effect on the disease. So we need more shots on goal. And that's what we get here. We have drugs that target C9, SOT1, uh, tyrosine kinase, urate, Tregs, as I said earlier. And they're not just multiple targets. If you go down to the gray, it's multiple approaches. Uh, again, we don't know what's going to work. So the more we, more different type of approaches we have on our hand, the better it's going to be. It's like we you know when you go to war and you have different type of weapons, you don't know which we're gonna, you're going to use, uh, and which one is going to be effective against the enemy. And this is the same thing. We have small molecule approaches. We have antibody approaches stem cells approaches, antisense oligonucleotides that Merit talked about, AV approaches. The, the, going down to blue, we have engagement now. Uh, FDA put out a guidance um, last year for ALS uh, sponsors. Industry has come together, as uh, Merit said, hun over 130 industry uh, uh, and co companies that are, uh, that are working on uh, ALS. And nonprofits are working together uh, and coming together uh, to, to, to um, collaborate. Uh, clinical trial efficiency. I mean, I, I can't talk more about what, from what Merit said here. The Healy platform is a perfect example of this. Um, uh, increasing efficiency is going to lower time, uh, reduce the cost, and, and increase participation by ALS patients. And the community is engaged. You're engaged. You're joining us today. You're listening to Merit and I speak. 
um, we, we need engagement from community at all levels, uh, whether it's to do surveys like the ALS Focus Program or to be part of the CDC registry, which is counting uh, the number of people that have ALS. Um, and finally, next slide. And I just want to give you one, for, uh, this is the, my last slide. Look, COVID, and we, we will talk about this during the Q&A session. COVID has had a, 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 a significant impact on research. Our fundraising is down uh, uh, significantly. Uh, and as Merrick mentioned, there were trials that were, uh, that had to be put on hold uh, during uh, the COVID phase. Uh, and, and so let me just talk uh, here about, you know, that hasn't stopped on the ALS Association. In the last six months or the first six months of this year, from January uh, through end of June, we have committed over $13 million to for 44 different projects. And one of them was, the, was $3 million to the Healy ALS platform trial. Again, this is a, one of the most significant uh, developments in the ALS field. It was probably one of those historic things that we'll all remember decades from now, uh, that Merit and her partners at MGH uh, started this trial and really changed the arc of ALS drug development. Uh, but beyond the $3 million to the Healy trial, we gave $2.5 million to five different preclinical drug discovery projects. We gave uh, over half a million dollars to NEILS uh, that Merit talked about to its infrastructure to clinical trial training. Uh, we funded uh, one and a half million dollars to seven projects that uh, work on developing new technology, better uh, wheelchair, uh, better eye gaze technology, better apps, um, and to study quality of life issues. Uh, we just, you may have heard, recently funded a half a million dollar study to Neuron, uh, to the Brainstorm trial, uh, to fund um, uh, their biomarker assess assessments or measurements in their phase three trial. And we can, I, I, gave, I told you earlier, we can't do this by ourselves. We got, we got to use um, partnerships and collaboration. So here's an example of partnership. We, we in partnership with Target ALS, we just funded a uh, TDP43 assay development initiative. Uh, similarly, with Project ALS, another nonprofit organization, we funded uh, testing of uh, uh, eight uh, FUS genetic uh, ALS patients with gene therapy. And finally, we launched ALS Focus, a patient and caregiver uh, survey program where we want to hear from you and your and caregivers about uh, about the disease. And so, with that, I think I'll stop here. And um, thank you again for. Um, uh, allowing me to give you an update. Um, thanks so much, Kalti. Uh, Jumana, uh, um, uh, am I correct in saying that individuals who have questions can go in the chat room? Yes, they can uh, send it in a chat or, um, yes, absolutely. We, we do have some questions that were um, sent in uh, prior to uh, the present conference. Um, let, let me and there are already some or, uh, in there already in the chat. Yeah. To the uh, so, Merit, um, you spoke a little bit about inherited ALS, which, which is a small group, maybe 5%, 5 to 10%. Um, one individual asked, why do people get non inherited ALS? Yeah, that's a really good question. We don't have all the answers. Um, there's a, a really nice study that Dr. Al Shalabi in UK did where he looked at the um, the incidence or how many people get the illness by by age, by decade. And um, by doing some fancy statistics, he concluded that there's probably about five to six things that happen to someone in their lifetime that leads to getting ALS. And if you happen to carry a gene mutation, that accounts for four of those. If you don't carry a gene mutation, then there's six or so different things. And those six things are likely different for each person. There's no one like, uh, for, for not to use a pun, but smoking gun, there's nothing like 
smoking causes lung cancer. There's not like something like that that causes ALS, but there's lots of small things. So the things that seem common is it gets more common as you age. So oddly enough, age is a risk factor. Uh, smoking is a small risk factor. Uh, maybe it doubles the risk, but it, it's not huge. Um, there's an increased risk in people who play football, American football, as well as uh, European football. But these are all small risks in each person. It might be a, you know, a different set of things. So it's, while it's really important to figure out, uh, I think probably we're going to get more success by doing some of the studies that Kozit mentioned by uh, you know, really trying to study the biology of the disease in people rather than the risk factors because there, aren't, there haven't been any obvious risk factors yet. So uh, Merritt mentioned age as being an important risk factor, which is true of all of our neurodegenerative diseases, maybe for a variety of reasons. So, uh, Kaldeep, you, you were in the Parkinson's disease field in the past. Um, has that been helpful in um, your present work in ALS? Are there similar kinds of challenges yeah, thank you for the question. Just uh, uh, for the last question, a plug for CDC registry. Um, you know, this is what, uh, as Merritt said, there's small things. There's not a smoking gun, but small things are hard to find. <laughs> and so this is what the CDC registry does. It collects information on what you're exposed to, because then those small things can be identified and we potentially may have that smoking gun in the future. So uh, please, please uh, participate in that. Thank you, um, Dr. Roos, uh, for that question. Uh, you know, Parkinson's is very similar to uh, ALS in many ways. Um, heterogeneous disease that looks different in everyone, uh, a patient to patient. Uh, we have no biomarkers. We don't really understand a risk factor. We can't um, put our hand on a particular smoking gun. 90% uh, of it is sporadic or non-genetic and 10% of it is genetic. Um, and so, you know, it, the challenges are the same. What I would say what I've learned is that there's a lot to learn from each other. Uh, these diseases, Alzheimer's, MS, uh, Huntington's, and Parkinson's, um, they, they all have the same underlying biology, uh, the same pathways, inflammation, autophagy, uh, Merit talked about protein handling. Uh, these things are uh, these pathways are important and they must be converging. And so if we know more information from one field, the other, other fields can learn from that and, 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 and sort of jump forward. Um, and so it's going to be very important to not just be ALS centric. I think we have to think, um, and, and I know that Dr. Sikovic and, and you, Dr. Ruz, go out to these uh, conferences with other diseases and other disease organizations because learning from each other is going to be very important. So um, Merritt, there are a few questions about the Healy platform trial. How did you pick those three drugs? And oh. are you going to compare those three drugs just like you're comparing each drug with the placebo and lastly, what happens after the Healy trial, right? It's, it's kind of a phase one, two trial. Do they stay on this drug? Do you tell them there's no difference between this and placebo? So how do you pick them? Sure. And you compare the different yeah. drugs and what happens after? Yeah. So we, we formed a committee uh, called our Thera Thera Therapy Evaluation Committee. And it had members, scientists from Niels and scientists from our centers. Uh, we had, um, a pa you know, patient representative. And uh, we set some criteria, which is we wanted uh, that the target that the drug went after was relevant for the illness and that they had pro proven in different models. And it could be a cell-based model or an animal model, but in more than one model that their drug hit that target. So, And then uh, the third thing is that they had to be have enough safety data in people, whether it's in healthy controls or in a different disease, that they knew the dose to go into the trial. So I'll say that actually that we designed it to be a more what I would call a late stage trial. So it's what I would call a phase two, phase three. So that if um, the drug is positive, this 
this uh, the study could be considered what we call registrational, which means that it's good enough to go to the FDA with. So, um, so th for a drug to be ready for that, you, you have to know its, its dose and safety. So those are the criteria. Um, and I'll say, even though we picked, we initially were gonna only pick three, but we had five that met those criteria. This is why we picked five. And there were several others that were really good. They just didn't have everything yet. And we're still in discussions with those, with those companies. Um, so if, so we, we, you can design these platform trials in many different ways. We did not design it to compare one drug against the other. And the reason is because that would never have gotten off the ground. And just to be honest, I mean, the, the, the companies are, you know, we wanted to get buy-in from companies and we had meetings with companies and they agreed to the sharing of the, the, the placebo and the sharing of the samples, uh, again, things that they don't usually do. Um, but obviously at the end, uh, you know, we, we will be publishing all the trials and people can look at the results of each of the trials. Um, but it's not designed a priori to be comparing against each other. Doesn't mean that like five years from now, we wouldn't change. So let's say, you know, the first, one of the first three works. Um, uh, and I'll just, for, let's say B works and the other two don't work. Then uh, we're, we would have like D and E and F already running. You can add B to all those arms, right? So you can start to build that cocktail, but you first have to show that something works and then, and then it's, you know, it's safe to add as a combination. But that, that's the ultimate goal is to anything that works becomes standard of care and standard of care is allowed in, in the platform trial. Uh, Carl Deep, um, this is a tough question. Um, what's the most exciting research area do you think? Or I'll let you pick two. Um, not, not related to clinical um, trials, for example, what what do you think? What 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 do you think is going to change the field, or, or will have the the biggest impact? Well, you just said I can't pick clinical trials, so I can't pick the Healy trial, <laughs> no, <laughs> which I'm very no. excited about. But here, here here's what I'll do. Um, uh, let me talk about some of the couple of out of the box ideas that we're funding. Um, so um, you know. This whole idea of using our microbiome to um, to understand ALS, to even perhaps use it as a biomarker for ALS, or even perhaps do you treat ALS? Um, you know, and, and this idea is not, you know, originated didn't originate in the ALS field. Uh, there have been other this this idea of changing us. So um, let me step back a little bit. Microbiome is all the number of microorganisms that live on our body and inside our body. So, you know, we're talking about billions and trillions of bacteria that live in our gut, that live in our GI system, that live on our skin. And the idea is that uh, perhaps something changes within the biology of these bacteria inside our body, which then uh, may be a cause for ALS, or may be a risk factor for ALS, or may drive pathology for ALS. So again, understanding, using the microbiome to understand the biology, and maybe perhaps even get new targets uh, for uh, merits Healy trial, uh, may, be, may be an interesting approach. That's a very out-of-the-box idea to use microbiome uh, to do a biomarker, maybe use it as a biomarker. Maybe in ALS, uh, the microbiome footprint or fingerprint is changed. And if we can understand what the fingerprint is in ALS, and we know what it is in people without ALS, then maybe it becomes a biomarker for diagnosis or prognosis, or maybe the treatment is working. And some people are even suggesting, we actually funded a out-of-the-box uh, a uh, study like this, uh, Bloom Science, uh, that is using um, a microbiome target, the idea that if you can change the target in, within the microbiome of our body, that perhaps that could have a positive effect on ALS. So again, very, you know, really out of the box idea um, that, you know, I, I would say high risk, high reward uh, type, type of uh, project. So that's just one idea uh, that, uh, of course, I, I think I'm really excited about the Healy trial. 
<laughs> I, I want to just uh, make one comment about uh, the microbiome, especially the gut microbiome. A donor recently gave $100 million to the University of Chicago, basically, to fund a gut microbiome institute. And um, this is a pioneer area, and uh, it's great to have the ALS Association funding that area because it's, it's untapped as far as uh, what the impact would be. Yeah. The, so, uh, can I, uh, Ray, just one, one quick thing. Um, you know, the other, I, I think, excitement uh, that we are working on currently on our new strategic, so the ALS Association is working on a, uh, our new strategic um, plan for the, and by, when I say new, I mean for the next five years. And one of the priorities that we are putting in the forefront is uh, what Merit mentioned, and I think your question alluded to, around risk factors. Um, you know, what are the different risk factors? And if, if they're not a smoking to cancer, then can we find something and validate it or elevate it to that level of smoking? So that we can say, don't do X, or don't eat Y, or don't play Z, uh, because that will prevent, you know, uh, or that way will reduce your chances of getting ALS. And, you know, we know the military veterans, for example, have a twofold higher risk of getting ALS. Why is that the case? Is it, is it exposure to chemicals? Is it, uh, you know, PTSD? Is it, uh, you know, them being out and, you know, being exposed to uh, environmental uh, toxins? Uh, you know, this type of research is going to be very important to understand, just like we have a drug development pipeline and you go from a target to drug development to clinical development, we would love to have a risk factor pipeline. You, do, you develop, you find out risk factors, you validate them, and then you make uh, prevention approaches. And I think that is the other, um, I would say, set of research that I'm really excited about. Uh, Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you short. <laughs> there, there were a couple of questions actually about risk factors being higher in military veterans, and it still is um, a, a question as to why that's the case. Uh, Merritt, do, do you think that these antisense oligonucleotides are going to work in inherited ALS? And it, is, is it going to help us? with non-inherited ALS in any way? Uh, yes and yes. <laughs> so um, I, I, mean, I do think that they're, they're, I mean, they, they should work, right? If, if, if our understanding of, of um, the genetics and how they cause the illness, the ability to shut it off should work. But obvi obviously there, there could be some safety issues. I mean, we're in new territory, but I think it has a really good chance. And I don't own any uh, stock in any of those companies. Um, but just so. The, I do also think it's going to be very useful in sporadic disease. I think, um, but we need to, in sporadic, we need to understand the targets, right? We got to know what is, uh, what would be important to lower, what would be important to increase so that we can test those, uh, those antisense approaches. But, you know, right now there's a huge interest in uh, things related to TDP43, like lowering the taxin 2 or increasing staphmin as ways to improve the biology, but I'm sure there'll be many more ideas coming out of the lab. And you, now you can make these antisense oligos relatively easily. You, you still have to do all that pipeline that, that uh, Kaldeep showed about testing, testing its biology and safety, but it's much faster than it used to be. So um, I hope everybody heard that the answer to the first question was yes, that uh, Merritt was cautiously optimistic about this clinical trial. Um, Merritt, do you, do you want to mention about spinal muscular atrophy and antisense oligonucleotides? Yeah, so, so spinal muscular atrophy is a childhood form of motor neuron disease with a, with a different genetic cause, but it, it has a marketed uh, uh, treatment already with an antisense oligo that helps make more of a missing um, uh, protein. Uh, so here it's not blocking, it's, it's, in, it's uh, augmenting, but it, it, um, it works so well that it got fast-tracked, and it's amazing to watch these children that usually couldn't, you know, um, might pass away by age two, look, look normal at that age. It's, uh, it's amazing. Now there's three treatments out there for spinal muscular atrophy, two 
you know, gene therapy. They're all kind of gene therapy in a way, but it's amazing, it's transformational. And so I'm hoping that we'll see the same in AOS. Yeah, just to, to pipe in, um, spinal muscular atrophy is a motor neuron disease like ALS, although there's clearly significant differences. But when trainees and residents ask me, you know, what has neurology done in the last five to 10 years that's a triumph, I talk about two things, stroke and antisense oligonucleotides and SMA, because it's transformational, just wonderful. Uh, so, uh, Carl Deep, you, you um, with, there's a number of ALS organizations out there. Um, is it good that we have so many? And uh, how do you think the ALS Association compares with others? You, you mentioned a little bit that, that the ALS Association has different targets and is the biggest funder for ALS in the world as far as philanthropic lay disease groups? Yeah, that's a very interesting question and I'll give you a little bit of a context coming from Parkinson's. So in Parkinson's, um, you could probably count the number of big research organizations on you know, one hand, maybe maybe two hands. There may be five, seven, eight uh, research organizations, uh, fu research funding organizations. When I came to ALS, we we have like over fifty. <laughs> uh, so uh, you know, relatively speaking, a disease is you know that's ten times you know in terms of rates smaller than Parkinson's has tenfold, you know, 10 times the number of nonprofit organizations that are funding research. And that's, there's, a, there's a plus and a negative there, right? The, the, the plus is, of course, the more organizations that are, the better. Uh, why not have 60 organizations instead of six uh, that are funding ALS research? That's, that's really good. Um, the negative could be that you have to make sure that they're working in a complementary way, in a co collaborative way, that they're not, you know, we're not being redundant in what we fund. Uh, and so we, you know, and for me, I, I, I don't see the fact that we have 60 organizations as a negative. I actually think that it's a, it's a really good thing that we have community that's that and so engaged. Um, and as I said earlier, and Merritt said earlier, it's a complex disease. This is a complex challenge. You know, it's not gonna be just enough for one large organization. It's gonna require a village. And so I'm happy that there are 60 organizations. I'll, get, I'll tell you though what, um, what we're doing. Uh, we are making sure that we speak to each other. Uh, we, we collaborate. So I, I gave an example of the Target ALS uh, project you know what, how that came about? I was thinking of uh, doing a biomarkers initiative around TDP43 at the ALS Association. And in speaking to Manish, uh, my um, um, sort of, um, you know, um, uh, companion on the target ALS side, I found out that they had actually worked on a TDP43 initiative for a year. They had developed the project, they had a steering committee, there was no reason why the ALS Association had to do the same thing all over again and spend a year when Target ALS had done that work. And so it was, it was better, it was more efficient for us to fund them directly and partner with them so that now they had more funding, their funding and our funding, to do, go forward on the TDP43 initiative. And that really helped uh, with lowering the redundancy in the, in the portfolio. Same way I'm going to be sitting on the Department of Defense um, steering committee. Uh, the Department of Defense gives out $20 million each year uh, to, for ALS drug development. And I'm going to sit on that committee, so I'm going to know what, what, um, what projects are coming in, uh, what approaches are being uh, uh, sort of stimulated forward. Um, and I've also said, as, as Merit said, on the, on the nonprofit uh, committee for the Healy trial. So I, I'm able to see the preclinical pipeline that the DOD is, is uh, uh, providing and 
the uh, clinical pipeline that the Healy trial is uh, forwarding. And so this is really the way that, that collaboration is going to be key for such a complex uh, disease and challenge that we have on our hands. So here's a tough one for you, Merrick. If you had ALS, what clinical trial would you participate in? Uh, that's a tough one. I thought Kobe was getting all the hard questions. Well, I, I think the good news is there's a lot of choices, right? And so I think, I think if I had, I'll take the easy answer. If I had the genetic form, I would definitely try to get into one of the antisense oligos. Uh, the sporadic form, I think it, it's, um, I think there's so many good ones. I would try to do one. I mean, I'm biased. I think I like the, plat the platform trial because there's, there's, there's more chance of being on the active treatment. There's a guarantee of the open label extension and uh, there's a community that picked the best sciences. So I, I'm, I'm totally biased there, but, but I also think it's a really, I think all the other ones, the single ones like uh, Lexion and um, the Mesitinib's coming, they're all good science and, and they might be better for someone who perhaps uh, wants to know for sure which drug that they're going to be uh, getting. So at least for patients, I think it's good that there's a lot of choices. But you do need a really good relationship with your neurologist and your team and people that you trust that can walk through the different options because we're at a different phase now. That, as you mentioned, Ray, when there used to be one trial, the, the answer was easy. Now there's a lot of choices for people and it's about understanding the science and what's right for you and all the details. Um, so either Merritt or Carl Deep, somebody asked about um, the fact that men are um, preferentially targeted in ALS. They mentioned an inherited ALS, and I, I wasn't aware of that, and maybe you are Merritt or Carl Deep, but, but certainly in non-inherited ALS, there's um, a greater preponderance of men. Um, why is that? case. Yeah, uh, Merit, should I take this first? And, and then, okay. Um, you know, we, we don't know. I, I, you asked about Parkinson's and Parkinson's is a similar way that it affects men more than it affects women. This is why when I showed you the ecosystem chart, understanding the biology is so important. You know, what is it about, um, is it estrogen? Uh, regulation of, of cellular pathways that somehow impart some protection. It's not, it doesn't impart all protection. We know that ALS also and Parkinson's also hits women. Uh, but if there is this propensity for men to have it more, is it something biological that is driving that? Is it a risk factor? Is it that, you know, um, traditionally or historically, men may have been you know, exposed to a particular chemical more, uh, you know, again, we don't, you know, we don't know uh, why that is the case, but this is why risk factor research, biology research, um, environmental research is so important because it'll start to kind of give us this, uh, you know, some ideas on, on what is driving that gender difference. Any... Yeah, no, I agree, and and we know that that it's it's not it's equally common once women pass menopause. So there is something telling us that, but it doesn't necessarily need to be hormones. Just like you said, it could be something else that people do that's different, and we need we need the CDC registry and these type of studies to figure it out. So we we we've made great strides in understanding ALS, but there's a lot of important questions that remain unanswered, especially these epidemiological ones. Um, so uh, my colleague, Dr. Betty Sullivan, asks a question regarding the Healy platform and that some patients may be on Rilyazole and some patients may be on Radicava. And how do you sort that out in this platform? Yeah. Yeah, so the most important thing is, is people are allowed to be on anything that's considered standard of care, which is, uh, and those are both standard of care. We do, uh, at the beginning, stratify by use of those medicines, and, and that will allow, in the end, that the groups are balanced, so that there'll be the same percentage of people on Rilazole um, in, in each group, or Rilazole and Darabo in each group, or Darabo, and so that, that becomes kind of part of the background. 
And similarly, if anything else gets approved, you know, during the during the platform trial and becomes standard of care, that would be allowed. Um, so, um, Merritt, uh, are there other um, clinical trial strategies? Kind of the the next one after the healing, you know. Right. Uh, and I say this uh, because. Um, you know more about this by far than I, but it, it, we are in an era when clinic, clinical trials are, are very much being studied and becoming more sophisticated. And that's especially true in neurology when, because of new technologies, we, we have new targets and new ways of, of reaching those targets. So what, 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 what's on the horizon? Yeah, I think there are, there are a lot of other approaches uh, being thought of. Um, again, we're not often the first to think of it. They're often done in, in uh, oncology and other fields. There's something called the N of one uh, approach, which is actually not one person. It took me a long time to understand that when I was taking biostatistics. Um, but the idea there is that if you have a short-term outcome measure, let's say neurofilament level, if that turns out to be good, you can, in a group of maybe 20 people, um, have people go on and off the drug and the placebo in random order and use and then measure your outcome measure in these periods. And with like, let's say 20 people, you could uh, do an equivalent to a 240, you know, long study, but you're basically looking within people at short, short outcome measures and seeing if the drug works. So it's a good early phase approach, uh, but you need that short-term biomarker or a short-term readout for that to be a successful approach. So people are thinking about that for like C9 ALS, where you can measure something called dipeptides in the spinal fluid, or maybe neurofilament if that turns out to be good. That's one way. And then there's these things called basket trials, where you target, you can have people with different forms of a disease, uh, different diseases, but the same biology in the trial. So for example, for again, for the C9 form of ALS, let's say a drug lowers but the dipeptides, well, that would make sense for uh, people with C9, whether they have ALS, whether they have frontal temporal dementia, whether they have some other C9 disease. And you could take all comers based on the biology. Um, uh, Kaltip, uh, somebody mentions here a, um, a website that, that I don't know, but maybe oh, www.imals.org. Um, and maybe you or Merritt know this, or other valuable websites besides the ALS Association website. Yeah. Well, imals.org is, uh, IMALS is a, uh, another nonprofit organization. Um, you know, the, amongst the 60 that I, I mentioned earlier, um, that is uh, driving and advocating uh, for um, ALS patients. And, and uh, you know, I, I think, uh, and so this, I, I think that question was around this clinical trial dashboard, which is what Merritt was talking about earlier, that, you know, we need, we need more people for trials. And whether you use the IMS, IMALS's dashboard, or whether you go to neils.org, uh, or you go to clinicaltrials.org, um, you know, find, find those trials. Niels.org uh, does a really good job in connecting uh, trials in your area uh, to, uh, and, and this way you can then go to your doctor and neurologist and, and talk about potentially enlisting in those trials. We uh, fund uh, the Niels coordinator, uh, Carly, who could, uh, you know, question, uh, answer questions. Uh, you can call, uh, I don't, unfortunately, don't have that number with me right, right off the bat, but uh, you can call Carly and she can uh, connect you with trial coordinators. It uh, doesn't mean guarantee that you would get into a trial, but we need more people trying out for these trials. And remember, if you can't get into a drug trial, we, and you know, for some reason for criteria, there are natural history studies that are going on that we can learn from. There are biomarker studies that are going on that we can learn from. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot that um, you, uh, and, that the research has in terms of your participation is a huge value. And so please, please participate. Go to niels.org. 
uh, for clinical trials participation. Okay, we're out of time. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Oh, oh no, I, I was going to just say, I think it's good to have lots of options and, you know, and places to go. Uh, I think this IMALS is a great uh, website as well. And, and this new uh, rating of trials is, I think, going to be transformational on, uh, on pushing uh, companies to, to be more patient-centric in their designs. So, uh, but um, I think anyway, lots of good options. We can, we can list all those resources in our wrap-up email. I think it's very important to make sure you have a, a valid website because uh, you may get some misinformation, but the ones we've mentioned are absolutely valid. Uh, I wanted to thank Merit and Kaldeep, um, especially Merit because she had told us that it was her vacation time. Yes. I don't know about you, Kaldeep, whether it's your vacation. It's but relaxing. I appreciate all you have done for the ALS field, as well as helping us today. Uh, and thank you, Jamana. Let me turn it back yeah. to you. Th thank you, Dr. Sakovic. You could have been on a vacation, on a cruise somewhere fun, <laughs> instead of here on a, uh, on a Saturday. Same for you, Dr. Davi. Thank you. And Dr. Roos, we thank can't you. thank you. Of course, thank you. Uh, Dr. Roos, we can't thank you enough. I don't know what I can thank you for. You can always come through for us. Um, and thank you all of you who, took time off from your Saturday to be here listening to us um, and for your support. Um, as you all know, we can't do anything without your support and all our uh, um, services are totally free of charge and without your ongoing support, we can't do any of this stuff and bring all this information back to you. So um, we count on you to continue your support. If you uh, would like to, um, continue your donations. We, you know, all this research that you heard Dr. Davi uh, talk about, it's all because of funds uh, raised through our uh, uh, walk programs and um, other uh, programs that we, uh, we fundraise for. So we will have, we didn't go through all the questions. Some of it we will uh, continue, we will send through email and this recording will be available shortly. We will let you know via email when we wrap it up. And Again, Jamana, thank you, everyone. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say thank you, everybody. Uh, go to ALS.org uh, and, and show us your support. We really uh, thank you for, uh, for your support uh, as Jamana. Yeah. Especially in time of COVID, it's been hard as it is. So anything we, uh, we can do together, we have to beat it. And I know Dr. Segovich would, is going to find us a cure soon. Wow. We'll do it together. Yeah. Thank you. This is a great yeah. day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.